When, uh, when my oldest son, Noah, who's 22 now, was a little guy, like a lot of little kids, he, he saw the world in black and white terms. Any parents relate to that? We would watch shows or something, and he would lean over and he would say, dead, good guy or bad guy, good guy or bad guy. Because he wanted to know who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, and kids are like that, right? I remember one time, I don't remember how old he was, we were watching, it was like election season, and one of those political attack ads was on. I won't even say who it was. But he, he, he's like, good guy or bad guy, Dad? I'm like, mm, well, depends on who you're listening to, son, right? Because as you grow up, you realize it's not, the world's not like that, is it? It's not neatly divided into black and white, good and bad. We're, we're all kind of mixed bags, and it kind of depends on who you listen to sometimes. Now, we're in a series called With Jesus, where we're looking at what does it mean for us. The call to follow Jesus is not a, like a part-time thing. It's an all-the-time thing, and it means to live our lives with him. Well, what does that look like, to live with him? And one of the things it means is it, we're examining the people that he ate with, which might seem like a strange thing to study, but we learn a lot from the people that Jesus sat down and had table fellowship with, because that was a powerful symbol in the ancient world that meant acceptance, invitation. And what we see is Jesus was really in off, often in trouble for the people that he ate with, from the religious leaders. The good guys of Jesus' day were often annoyed with him for eating with the bad guys and girls of Jesus' day. From the perspective of the religious leaders, Jesus was doing two things that really irritated them and offended them. Number one, he claimed to have divine authority, and he talked about the kingdom as if he was the king. And number two, he was including all the wrong people in this kingdom vision, at least by their understanding. Let me read Luke 7, verses 33 to 35. This will be a good lead-in to the story we're going to examine in a few moments, but... Jesus here is talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, as you know, came before Jesus, pre preaching a message of repentance. He lived in the desert. He ate wild uh, honey and locusts. He wore camel's hair. He was kind of a radical dude. And Jesus says, John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man, that means himself, has come eating and drinking. You say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. We'll get to what he means there. But his point is, you look at John, you say, well, that guy's a crazy man. You look at me and you say, well, that guy is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, which is it? Jesus was frequently in trouble for the people he spent time with. Now, uh, missiologist and anthropologist Paul Hebert grew up in India. You have to bear with me for a minute. This will make sense in a moment, I hope. He grew up in India as a missionary kid. He looked around and he saw illiterate tribal people in the, in the, in the rural parts of uh, India coming to faith in Christ after hearing the gospel one time. And he began to ask the question, what's the criteria for being a Christian? How much theology and doctrine and information do you have to know? Can you become a believer in Jesus only hearing the gospel one time? Or do you have to know some stuff and read some stuff as well? He wrestled with this question. And to answer it, he imported concepts called set theory from mathematics. Now, I'm terrible at math, but I think I get it as he brings it inside of, of, uh, of Christian philosophy. So you'll see here on the screen what, it call, what, he, what are called bounded sets and centered sets in math. He brings them inside this question about what's a Christian. Okay? So a bounded set is static. It's defined by boundaries and limits. Right beliefs, right behaviors, you're inside. Wrong beliefs, wrong behaviors, you're outside. You get it? There's a, there's a boundary. Now, clearly, there are boundaries to our lives, and there are boundaries to what it means to be a true believer in Jesus. But a bounded set means there's insiders and outsiders based on what we believe and, what, and how we act. A centered set is different. A centered set is not defined by, uh, it's, it's dynamic, not static. It's not defined by boundaries, but by movement. In other words, the people or the things in this set are moving in a particular direction toward the center. So to put it in Christian terms, a Christian is somebody who has Jesus as the center of their life and they're moving closer and closer to him. And what Hebert said is that for, for many Christian traditions, we use only bounded set thinking. Only who's in and who's out. And what we ought to start thinking about is Centered set thinking, meaning what it really means to follow Jesus, to be with him, is to have him as the center of your life and to continually move closer to him. Because if you do that, he'll rearrange your thinking. He'll rearrange your behavior. You'll become more and more like him. Okay, well, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day clearly had bounded set thinking. They clearly saw the world as insiders and outsiders, clean and unclean, good and bad, like my little son's question. Now, of course, there are some boundaries, as we said, 
But Jesus is looking at things a little differently. Let's read the story from Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. Uh, this is one of my favorite, I know I say this all the time, but this is it's really true. This is one of my favorite stories in all the New Testament. It's just an incredible, such a rich story. Okay. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender owed two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It's such an amazing story. There's so much happening in, in this. Um, it's, to understand it, we have to understand a little bit about the cultural context in which this dinner party takes place, right? Jesus is a visiting rabbi, traveling rabbi, gets invited by a Pharisee over for dinner. Now, every culture has certain etiquette that's unspoken, but we all understand. Ways of greeting and honoring people or insulting them as well. For example, I've noticed that adult males and adolescent males in our culture have different ways of greeting. Have you noticed this? Adolescent males do greet like this, with the upward head nod. What's up? So adult males go the opposite direction. Hello, how are you, right? Adolescent males give the fist pound. Adult males give the handshake. It's different. Have you noticed how adolescent, female, adolescent females greet each other? Ah! They run. Oh, it's great to see you. I can't believe you look amazing. Right? It's just, it's, adult females, not so much. It's more of the side hug. Oh, Cindy, how are the kids? Right? So we don't, think, we, we don't think about it because we're in that culture, but we behave differently according to like, acceptable norms and rules. So in first century Judaism, there were three, if you have somebody over for dinner, there are three non-negotiables, three things that just, you just did because it's part of the culture. It's the way you behaved. Number one, the kiss of peace. You greet your guests with a kiss. Now, if it's an honored guest, like a rabbi, you kiss them on the hand. If it was an equal, you kiss them on the cheek. But there's a kiss of peace. That was customary, normal behavior. Number two, you'd wash their feet. Well, probably you have a servant wash their feet. If they were very highly honored, you might wash their feet. Well, that would somewhat be humiliating for you. At the very least, you would give them water to wash their own feet, but that would be somewhat insulting. And number three, you anoint their head with oil. It's a way of symbolically saying, may God's favor rest on you in my home. It was, it was customary in their culture. So we see in the story, Jesus Invited over, receives none of these. No kiss, no water, no washing, no anointing. Now, it's important for us to get into our heads. This is, these are not like unintentional um, misses, oversights. These are intentional insults. Simon invites Jesus over, and it was not uncommon for a visiting rabbi to come over to a Pharisee's home and, you know, have discussions about religious matters. That was normal behavior. But what's not un what is unusual is Simon's not inviting Jesus over to honor him. He's inviting him over to expose him. He thinks he's a fraud. He wants to show everybody this guy's not the prophet you think he is. That's why he treats him this way. Let's talk about the scene at Simon's house. Now, you might be thinking, like, are they at a table like this table? You know, sitting at high chairs, the high table, and is the woman, like, under the table at his feet? Like, how does this work? Some of you will know that in ancient Eastern cultures, even in some Bedouin cultures in the Middle East today, they eat at low tables. 
few inches off the ground, and they reclined on their right elbow on cushions with their feet kind of stretched up behind them. So the woman is not under the table. She's behind Jesus at his feet, visible to everyone. And Simon, you know, likely across the table or nearby. This was happening in Simon's home. You might think, well, how'd they all get into Simon's home? Very likely, Simon, being a wealthy uh, Pharisee, would have his home, like most of the homes of wealthy men in those days, like three-sided with an open courtyard in the middle. And people from the town could gather on that open side. They couldn't come in to the dinner, but they could gather near uh, open side, and they could listen to the pearls of religious wisdom that dropped from the lips of the rabbis and sages and so forth. So it would be not uncommon to have this dinner party like this with religious leaders there, and the townspeople gathered in that open area to listen in. Enter the woman who comes out of the crowd right to the table. Sh this is shocking behavior. Now, I want to speculate a bit about what, what motivated this woman. We don't know. We're not told. But we know a little bit about her, that she's a woman of the city, that she's a sinful woman. She has a reputation in town. Simon seems to know about it and others as well. No question she'd made some bad choices and had some broken places in her life and heart and had a reputation. Very likely she'd been mistreated as well by men. This is a broken person. A person looked down on in that culture. Some of it her own doing, some of it done to her. Maybe she hears Jesus teach this message of the kingdom of grace and forgiveness, and she's so compelled by it because she wonders, could it be for someone like me? So she goes to the dinner party just to listen in from a distance. And she sees the way Jesus is treated, and it's breaking her heart. She can't stand it. But what can she do? Well, she goes forward and in her own way does what was not done by Simon for Jesus. It, letting her hair down alone. In that culture, for a woman to let her hair down in public was grounds for divorce. So ladies, what's up? Right, no, <laughs> no, I mean, this is a different culture, right? This is shocking behavior. You would never touch a man who wasn't your husband. She kisses his feet? This is totally self-abasing and shocking behavior in this culture. She pours out this jar of ointment, an alabaster jar of perfume. Can you hear the whispers in the crowd? She's let her hair down before, you know. She's poured that perfume out for other men before, you know. But this time she's getting it right. It's different this time. This is an incredible scene. Jesus looks at her without a hint of judgment in his eyes. No condemnation, only love, grace. He sees her not as an object to be desired or rejected, which is how most all men saw her. But he sees her as somebody that God loves, somebody who's valuable, has worth and dignity. Maybe he's the first man to look at her that way in decades. And it undoes her. She begins to weep. Now, of course, Simon uh, is sitting there at the dinner table, sees all of this. And this party's not going at all like he planned. And he thinks to himself, well, this guy clearly is not the real deal. I knew it. See, because if he was, he would never allow this to happen. He should know better. Now, I don't think Jesus needed all of his omniscient power to know what was in Simon's heart in this moment. But the text is pretty cool. I don't know if you caught this. Simon is thinking these things in his head, and Jesus answers his thoughts. Jesus does this routinely, which I think is just so cool. He says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. And the implication is, you're not going to like it very much. Tell me, teacher. Can you almost hear the bite in his tone? He doesn't think he's a real teacher. Tell me. And he tells this amazing little short parable, which is so profound for us today. He says, two men owed money. To a money lender. Now, in that culture, if you got yourself into debt where you couldn't pay, you were thought of as really, you were a loser. If you lended money, like a loan shark kind of thing, you were a serious loser. These are not, all three characters, money lender and the two men, are not to be praised in this story, in other words. One owes 50 denarii. That's, f that's 50 days' wages. A denarii is a day's wage on average. One owes 50 days' wages. One owes 500 days' wages. So it's a lot of money either way, but one is a lot more. What do these men have in common? Did you catch it? What do the two men share? Neither could pay. Neither one could pay the money back. 
So the loan shark cancels the debts of both. And Jesus asks a simple question. Which one will love him more? See, Jesus knows that in his heart, Simon sees himself as a small debtor. Simon sees himself as the guy who only owes 50. I mean, I'm not perfect. Only God is perfect. But I'm a lot closer than you people. I mean, God's getting a pretty good deal when it comes to me. Let's look around. I don't do what that guy does. I don't behave the way she does. I mean, I'm, you know, God, if, if God grades in the curve, which by the way, he doesn't. But if he does, you know, I'm, I'm the guy setting the curve. That's how Simon sees himself. He wouldn't say that out loud, but Jesus knows that's what's in his heart. This is Simon's problem. He doesn't see what Jesus sees. He misjudges the woman, he misjudges Jesus, and he misjudges himself. And he needs to have his eyes opened. And I think so do we. Let's ask this question in three ways. What do you see? What do you see? First, when you, what do you see when you look at other people? For Simon, this woman is outside the boundary, the bounded set, right? She's, she's outside the acceptable moral behavior. Let's look at verse 39. We get a picture into Simon's heart when it comes to the woman. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him to dinner saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. It couldn't be clearer how he, what he sees. He sees behavior. He sees an object to be ridiculed and disdained. Thomas Traherne was a 17th century metaphysical poet. He was C.S. Lewis's favorite metaphysical poet, so I had to read him. And he read a book called A Century of Meditations, which is 100 Meditations on Life, the Meaning of Life. And Meditation 63 goes like this. You never enjoy the world aright until you esteem every soul in it so great a treasure as our Savior doth. I just think it's cool to say the word doth, right? Think about that. You never enjoy the world aright. You never live rightly in the world until you esteem, you see every soul, every person in it as a great treasure in God's eyes. That ought to convict you. Do you see every soul as a treasure? You see every person in your life, your next door neighbors, the guy behind you or in front of you in line, the guy cutting you off in traffic, people you work with? Look around the room for a minute. I know it normally looks straight ahead at the pastor, but it's kind of fun for me to make you look around the room. Look around the room. Go on, turn your heads, look. It's awkward, but that's fun for me. <laughs> what do you see, right? What you, these are people that God loves. Not just inside the bounded set of the church, but in the world. This convicts me. I don't, I don't always see everyone this way. You never really see the world right until you see people the way Jesus sees them, as treasures. Objects of his love. Sometimes we just don't see. And we need to have our eyes open. Just, just this last week, I, I went to Colorado to visit. I'm in a pastor's group. We meet a few times a year to encourage each other and learn from each other. And I flew into Denver. I was driving to Colorado Springs on 25. And traffic was brutal. I was just standstill on Route 25. And I was so annoyed, I sent my wife a text of all the cars in front of me. And with like one of those emojis, like, uh, face, you know. And she texted back. And I said, look at this. I'm stuck in traffic. I'm going to be late. She texted back. She said, boy, the sky and mountains are beautiful. <laughs> and I was like, uh, oh, yeah, they are. On my phone and in real life, you know. We just don't see, right? Sometimes we don't see what's right in front of us. We need to have our eyes opened. Let me read verse 44, the first part of it, where we get a picture of this. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? What a question. I don't know if you're getting the scene here. Remember the table. Low reclining table, Jesus le leaning on his elbow, looking at Simon, Right? He, to, see, to turn toward the woman, what does he have to do? She's behind him. He has to raise up and turn and look at her. But he's talking to Simon. Isn't this, like the drama, Hollywood can't touch it. He raises up, he looks at the woman who's weeping at his feet, and he's talking to Simon. He says, do you see this woman? What a question. Does Simon see her? Well, I mean, with his physical eyes, he's aware that she's in the room. But he doesn't see her. Not really. Not the way God sees her. I doubt anybody at the table or in the courtyard that night saw what God saw. Past the broken life, the abuse, the bad decisions, the shattered dreams, to a soul that God treasures, to someone he loves. 
it's inter- interesting to me, this woman never speaks a word in the story, at least not one that's recorded that we hear. But her actions tell us volumes about her, don't they? We know all we need to know about this woman. C.S. Lewis wrote that prostitutes are in no, uh, no danger of desiring their present life so much they would not turn to God. But I would submit that sometimes suburban Christians in Chicagoland are in danger of desiring our present life so much that we would not turn to God. She's broken. She has nowhere else to go. So she goes to the only place she can go, to Jesus. Imagine being this woman for a minute in front of all these religious elites, the whole ta- half a town watching. Jesus stares at you, speaks words of forgiveness and grace to you. And Jesus tells us that it's because of how much she knows she's been forgiven that she can love so freely. I mean, think about this woman. What's happening to her? She's leaving the crowd, going to Jesus, breaking all the cultural rules, right? Weeping, kissing, pouring out. All of this is an act of worship. Do you ever lose yourself in worship? I mean, like, just forget where you are because you're worshiping Jesus. I don't do it very often. Every now and then, little moments. Right? It's sort of transcendent, right? Most of the time, it's like, ah, praise him. You know, that's not, what do we do around here? Because you're worried about what? What everybody else is doing and thinking. She has lost herself in the presence of Jesus. But for Simon, he can only love a little bit because he's only been forgiven a little, or so he thinks. Philip Yancey writes, not even God, with all of his omniscient power, can force a human being to love. Simon perceives himself to have little sin, therefore he needs little grace, therefore he has little love. Next question, what do you see when you look in the mirror? One of the big issues for us, I think, is the failure to see our own issues, our own sin. I've used this analogy before, but it's true. Sometimes I I apparently have very, very little feeling on my chin because frequently when we eat food that has melted cheese, it ends up here and I don't know it. And my kids when they were younger would tell me, Dad, 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 Benjamin used to say, cheese on your chin, cheese on your chin, Dad. And I would go, oh, oh yeah. It became a metaphor for me of the stuff about my life that I don't see. You've got stuff on your, and it's, it's, you've got spiritual cheese on your chin, friends. <laughs> stuff that, about your life that isn't good, and, and, but every else season you don't see. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you see yourself as a small debtor? Pretty good on the whole. When the holiness of God and his perfection ceases to be our standard and we make other people the standard, we're in danger of becoming Simon in our heart. We have the wrong measurement. I think one of the beautiful things about this story, which I never saw for years, is that Jesus loves the woman clearly, but he also loves Simon. Why does he tell that little story? For the woman's sake? She already gets it. For Simon's sake. This proud, arrogant, self-righteous guy, Jesus loves him too. G. Campbell Morgan says, Our Lord's love for the woman did not exceed his love for Simon. He was on his way to the cross for them both. When I read that, I, I, just, I, I hadn't seen that before. It's true. Verses 41 to 43 of the story. Again, the parable. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose. Can you hear how reluctant he is to answer? Who canceled, who had the larger debt canceled? You have judged rightly. The simple question Jesus asked Simon, which one will love him more? Which one will have more love? What is Jesus saying? Connect this with what he says at the end of the story. He who loves little has been forgiven little. But who's been forgiven little? Put your hand up if you only need a little bit of grace. (laughs) <laughs> At least you're listening or not listening, right? <laughs> who are the small debtors in God's kingdom? There aren't any. There's only those who think we are. And that's Simon's issue. We all owe more than we can pay. But do you like the, the show, The Antique Roadshow? Who likes that show? I've used it before. I love this the Antique Roadshow. Who's seen The Antique Roadshow? Okay, you don't know this show. The people bring stuff to the experts. And sometimes they bring junk, which they think is valuable, and they find out it's worthless, and I think that's hilarious. <laughs> but sometimes they bring stuff that they don't know if it's worth anything, and they find out it's extremely valuable, and that's, that's cool too. 
they bring like whatever it is, a picture they find in a barn, and they bring it to the, the expert. And then the, there's that moment when the money, the, the price comes across the bottom of the screen, you know, bring $100,000. <gasps> what? I had no idea. I found it in a barn, you know. Well, how do they know what the amount is? How does the expert know what amount goes to the bottom of the screen? 40000 20000 50000 a million? How do they know? Are they making it up out of thin air? No. The antique dealers know what? They know the market, which means they know the price someone is willing to pay for that item. I've seen it go for this. Someone's paid this. That's for it's worth that. Well, let me ask you. How do you know what, what a human being is worth? How do you know what you're worth? What are you worth? Is it your net worth? Is it your 401k? What's, what's the value of you? Well, it's the price someone was willing to pay for you. Friends, look to the cross. That's how you know what you're worth in God's eyes. Not because you make all the right decisions. You don't, and neither do I. But this is, when you see somebody, anybody, when I see someone, this is what should come into my mind. They're priceless because of the price that was paid, the ultimate price. This is not what Simon sees. Last question, what do you see when you look at Jesus? The sad irony here for Simon is that he actually believes his thoughts about Jesus and about the woman and about himself reflect God's thoughts. But when you understand this story, you find out that Simon's thoughts betray the fact that he does not understand God at all. He has an intellectual knowledge of God. He has doctrine about the law of God. He, he has memorized verses and passages. He knows religious information. But he has no experience of grace. C.S. Lewis said, a boy in love knows more about the universe than any astronomer. I think that's true. When you've been changed by God's love and grace... That's a different kind of knowledge than memorizing verses. You can know all kinds of Bible facts and not experience grace. They ought to go hand in hand, but they don't always. Sometimes, sadly, the people that I meet that have the most Bible knowledge can be the most unloving. It ought not to be so. And this is Simon's case. Jesus says, whoever's seen me has seen the Father. Paul says the Son is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God's like? Look at the life of Jesus. For all of her brokenness and failure, the woman is able to see Jesus. And Simon's not. Think about that for a minute. He's a guest. God is a guest at your dinner table, and you don't see it. You don't see it. Throughout this encounter at Simon's table, Jesus is raising an issue, a big question. It's explicit in the parable of the two debtors. It's implicit throughout the whole story. The question is this, who's the big debtor? Who's the big sinner? Remember what Simon says? He should know what she is. Simon thinks there's a big sin in the room, and there is, but it's not what he thinks. It's his own heart. It's eyes that are too proud to weep, hands that are too proud to serve, lips too proud to kiss, knees that won't kneel, and a heart that's too proud and stubborn to love. Now, I wish it wasn't true, but more often in my life than I like to admit, I'm Simon. I'm the one who thinks that I'm doing okay on the whole. Your capacity to love, friends, is directly related to your understanding of how much you've been forgiven. That's the point Jesus is making. You want to live a gracious, generous, loving life? You want to be free from fear and anxiety and having to hold on to everything for yourself and worried about your reputation and your image? Get in touch with your sin. It sounds counterintuitive. Get in touch with how broken you really are, and then you'll see how much you've been forgiven. And then you'll be free to love. The woman is, and Simon is not. The woman desperately needed grace for a life that was broken. Simon desperately needs grace for a heart that is proud. I, I look out this morning, and I'm guessing there are a lot of Simons and a lot of the woman here. Which do you need? You need grace and healing for a broken heart? 
or you need to have your heart broken because you're proud. The point of the story is Jesus loves you both. He loves us both. And the truth is we're all a mixed bag, aren't we? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we would all be outsiders if it wasn't for you. And we thank you that you don't view us that way. But while we were yet sinners, you died for us. That you move toward us and ask us to give our lives to you, making you the center of our hearts. Thank you for your incredible grace for people that are broken like this woman and for those of us that are proud like Simon. We thank you that you love us both. We praise you in your name, Jesus. Amen.